He was the first to ever play the 32 sonatas throughout Europe. List and was? Yes. Beethoven was his idol, and you remember when he's a child, he was ki kissed by Beethoven and uh, sanctified. Is that a true story? <laughs> it's uh, semi-true. Many, <laughs> many, many of the details probably were... Uh, he didn't get kissed. Well, uh, Liszt was a young boy, and he never stopped the legend, but uh, it's written in the thousand books. Hmm. Um, speaking of Beethoven, though, uh, in 1831... Who but Liszt could even play the Hummer Clavier, Beethoven's most difficult sonata? And Berlioz, who was a great advocate of Beethoven in France, mm -hmm. when Beethoven in France was not at all known, and listen to this, there was not a complete performance of a Beethoven sonata in England until 1848. In other words, they played just movements or not at all? Well, he just was too difficult to... Uh, intellectual, uh, enigmatic. Well, the Opus 106, when Berlioz heard Liszt play this, I mean, Berlioz confessed that this sonata was a riddle to him until Liszt solved it for him. And he instantly said, this is the pianist of the future. Yes, within Liszt's nervous system, he had all of the past and all of the present, uh, let alone the ability to feel the future in his body. He was able to uh, play differently. Uh, than anyone else. He, in other words, he knew what was coming. Uh, you're talking about this pianist. Uh, well, uh, there's um, Chopin who said, I wish I could steal from him the way he plays my own etudes. And then Wagner said that nobody, no one could know what the Beethoven sonatas really are unless he had heard them as interpreted by Liszt. And Schumann writing to Clara, a somewhat rival, Clara Schumann, uh, said that Liszt came to me and his genius is overwhelming. He played for me the Carnival, the Novelettes, the Fantasy. And in a hundred details, I never knew I conceived it that way, but it was just full of absolute genius. And uh, Wagner again writing uh, in regards to the well-tempered clavier, and Wagner wrote, I knew, of course, very well what was to be expected of Liszt at the piano. But what I had heard when he played these Bach pieces, I had not anticipated, although I had studied Bach thoroughly. This experience showed me how slight is the value of study as compared with revelation. Okay, here is Berlioz, Wagner, Schumann, three of the greatest musical minds of the 19th century, really saying that it was a revelation. Uh, James Huneker, that great connoisseur of piano playing and of everything, had heard every pianist of, from 1875 until his death. And to him, the greatest pianist that he had ever heard was Anton Rubinstein. Rubinstein... Von Bülow and Tausik were the three giant pianists of the last quarter of the 19th century. And uh, uh, from all reports, all three, the intellectual Von Bülow, the volcanic Rubinstein, and the technically unbelievable Tausik, all were rolled into list. He had everything. Uh, Tausik said that, uh, that he climbed solitary heights list. Uh, Rubinstein said we are all corporals next to this field marshal. Um, so we've had the opinion of great musical minds. This, this was the unapproachable pianist of all time, probably. What makes a great pianist? Is it the intellectual approach, looking at music as architecture, or is it... Uh, a mechanical ability and that the muscles of the fingers are just right, or is it the combination? Uh? Well, Liszt himself said that uh, technical uh, prowess uh, is the accursed duty of every performer, and that's where it ends, and then becomes the artist. Now, what makes an artist? I don't know. Uh, it's, it's too vast a subject, and uh, uh, Liszt was an artist in every way. 
but technique, it was probably unbelievable. Remember, he invented modern piano playing. This was the man that could sight-read anything, no matter how bad the manuscript handwriting was. Uh, he sight-read Balakarev's Islami, one of the most difficult pieces ever composed. Balakarev was a sensational pianist, and he couldn't play it himself. <laughs> the reports of his sight-reading are just unbelievable. He had a nervous system that was technically, that, that could assimilate all technical difficulty instantaneously, and he had an ability, and of course to make a performing artist this is maybe the prime ability, to feel and uh, make all styles comprehensible. But let's start with a piece that we do not know, the one mazurka list composed in his career, Mazurka Brillant, and it was composed in 1850. Thank you. 
Werner Johansson playing the Mazurka Brillant of Franz Liszt, composed in 1850. That's quite a lovely piece. And yes, surprised. never never performed. Yeah, quite surprised that it isn't, as a matter of fact. Uh, written around the time of the two Polonaises and uh, other works uh, that are slightly Chopin-esque after Chopin's death. And uh, Liszt, you know, also wrote books articles. Some were very important uh, critical articles, as well as the Chopin biography, and uh, a book which has been put down, and yet I think people can learn a lot from, is his book called The Gypsy in Music, I believe its title is, and it's reprinted now. And I think uh, there's a, a key in there to how to play the Hungarian Rhapsodies. Anyway, Chorley, who was the most influential and conservative critic of the day in uh, London wrote of Liszt as a pianist in mere technical skill after everyone else has ended Liszt had still something to add he could carry every man's discovery further could in could exhibit it in new forms in sweep of hand and rapidity of finger in fire and fineness of execution in the power over those exquisite momentary fancies and graceful touches which, when the music admits it, add so much to its charm, in memory so vast and comprehensive as to seem almost superhuman, in a lightning quickness of view enabling him to penetrate instantaneously the meaning of a new composition and to light it up properly with its own inner spirit, some touches of his own brilliancy added in a mastery complete, spontaneous, enjoying and giving enjoyment over every style and every school of music, all those who have ever heard Liszt frequently will join with me in saying he was unapproached among all executant instrumentalists. You see, the, the opinion coming from all quarters, from his students, from... Uh, uh, Chopin from Schumann, from critics, Hanslick, his major enemy, Wagner's also in uh, Vienna, reviewed a Liszt charity concert. He had not played for 30 years in Vienna, and Hanslick, who was immortalized as Beckmesser in The Meistersinger because of uh, Wagner's wrath, um, wrote again raptures of Liszt. He hated the composer, but this man the virtuoso, the executive artist, was obviously unbelievable. And woe is us not to hear him play his own works. There's a story which is typical of uh, uh -huh. Liszt's waiting. grand manner. Uh, a young woman student, and uh, even to his absolute end, he even traveled with, with an entourage of uh, students, many of them uh, adoring women. Uh, said, Master, when you die, the world will never know how your compositions actually sound. Oh, my dear, no, no. Uh, many of my students play them beautifully. Friedheim, so-and-so. No, Master, the world will never even have an inkling of how your music sounded. Liszt's reply. Perhaps, my dear, you are right. <laughs> uh, he liked to surround himself with diplomats, since he thought of himself as a diplomat. He hated hurting anyone, so perhaps this is why he thought. Well, it was, was a it diplomat. Was expedient for him, mm -hmm. of course, being a public figure. But. Uh, Especially in, in Rome, around the 1860s, he was surrounded with diplomats from every country, at the, being at the Vatican. And this is rather charming. The uh, English consul, Douglas, uh, was at Liszt's cloister, and Douglas suddenly approached Liszt with the words, May I entreat you to do me a favor? With pleasure, replied Liszt. May I strike a chord on your instrument? As many as you like, smiled Liszt. And now Douglas proceeded majestically to the piano, struck a chord, took out his notebook, and wrote on it. 
Monday, the 30th of May, 1864, afternoon at 4 o'clock in the cloister, before Liszt, I struck a chord on his piano. <laughs> <laughs> and here's another uh, story uh, of Liszt visiting various places <clears throat> in Rome, and he was taken to the insane asylum, and he had heard of... Uh, a young woman with a magnificent voice who, um, well, she was, the story here, she was hardly 20 years old and had lost her mind because of an unfortunate love affair. And she was possessed of a marvelous voice. The doctor called the poor girl. She approached with hesitating steps, a brunette Gretchen. Her glances expressed all the sadness of her soul and revealed her unspeakable misfortune. She stopped at the door. The doctor begged her to sing something or other, but she only shook her head. But sing, sing for Franz Liszt. He is here. This name seemed to awaken some memories in her. She glanced a moment around, but soon the previous apathy seemed to prevail again. Now Liszt came near to her and said in the sweetest tone, glancing at her with his hypnotic eyes, Why do you not wish to sing? Please sing Casta Diva. And then, she be and then he began quite softly to sing the beautiful Bellini melody. She then began to move her lips and continued the aria where Liszt had stopped. With a touching tenderness and purity, she sang the whole aria and remained as in an ecstatic trance until the end of it. After the last note, she fell again to her former insensibility. Too bad, Liz said, that they had incarcerated this poor girl together with insane women. Instead of keeping her separate and trying to work her affliction out through an appropriate musical treatment, and he worked very hard to get the girl out of the insane asylum, but to no avail. Well, I find it rather fascinating that uh, that was a time when someone could end up in an insane asylum from a bad love affair. Oh yes, it was. Uh, it was amazing. <laughs> Do people lose their minds over uh, love Not today? Anymore. Well, we can't say that where there's a lot of people but uh, <laughs> around. But That's true. They lose their minds over other things. Subways occasionally, I lose my life. <laughs> I walk now, <coughs> everywhere. Uh, let's listen to Kentner in Sposalizio, which is one of Liszt's finest lyrical pieces. It was inspired by Raphael's painting, The Marriage of the Virgin, which is at Milan. Louis Kentner, the artist. Thank you. 
Sposalizio by Franz Liszt and a performance by Louis Kentner. And we'll be back shortly with more music by Franz Liszt. Matt, let's now hear a work from 1883, The Old Man Liszt. And it's called Sleepless Question and Answer. It's a short composition. The artist Sergio Fiorentino. Sergio Fiorentino playing Liszt's work from 1883, Sleepless Question and Answer. And it's a very odd work. Yes, it's odd, as many of the other pieces of Liszt's later years are strange. I wonder if that's something he wrote on a notepad in the middle. Minor version, the second one. And who do we have playing it? Gunnar Johansson, yes.
One of Liszt's great works from his later years, La Lagubra Gondola, number two, composed in Italy. And these works, uh, well, he had premonitions of Wagner's death in Venice, and uh, these pieces were written under that mood. Let's hear now Gunnar Johansson, who just played that, the gondola number two, in a performance of a remarkable threnody, the Cypresses at the Villa d'Este. We heard the fountain piece. Liszt was just as obsessed with the magnificent cypress trees surrounding his apartments at the Villa d'Este. Gunnar Johansson, in the second of the two Cyprus works that Liszt wrote.
For three whole days in September 1877, Liszt spent every hour of sunlight and as much of night as was made visible by the moon in admiration of the cypresses. They obsessed his thoughts to the exclusion of all else, and this piece is the outcome of that period of time at the cypresses of the Villa d'Este in Rome by Liszt, and the performance was by Gunnar Johansson and We'll continue with Liszt's music tomorrow. Thank you for listening. <laughs>